So hello, my name is Annette DeFavory, and I'd like to welcome you to the BC Library Association Summer Conference. This session is part of our 2020 virtual webinar series titled, The Conversation Continues. BCLA is privileged to be presenting the 2020 Summer Conference from Vancouver, which is located on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. When the BC Library Association realized that COVID-19 would mean the cancellation of our in-person conference and the loss of some truly amazing conference sessions, we asked presenters if they would share virtually some of the fantastic ideas and work they had prepared for the in-conference session. This was an opportunity for BCLA to partner with conference presenters and contribute to the professional learning of our library community. Thanks to all the presenters who are contributing to the BCLA Summer Reading Conference. Let me um, give you a few words about today's session. So please note, the session is being recorded. And so any questions or comments in the chat window that are sent to all attendees will be included in the recording. Now, if you have a technical question, please send the message through chat, uh, but send it to all panelists. And that way one of our staff can get back to you and help you out if you need it. For questions or when it's time to ask questions to the presenters today, ask your, use chat, ask your question, but select all panelists and attendees and then everyone can see, your, can see your question. Today, I'd like to welcome Victoria Gomez, Kate Sidvi Haley, Peter Musser, Tariq Bembo, and they will be sharing their presentation titled, Student Government, Advocacy, and Library Work. Let me tell you a little bit about today's presenters. Victoria is currently in her last year at UBC iSchool in the MLIS program. She is a second generation Latinx settler in the Victoria, sorry, in the Vancouver area. Victoria has been involved in student government since her undergraduate degree in various roles, including as co-president of the Speech and Linguistics Students Association of UBC, GSS representative, club liaison and co-president of the Library and Archival Student Studies Students Association. I really should have just used the abbreviation. And chair of the Governance and Accountability Com Committee of the GSS. Victoria hopes to work in public and community libraries after graduation. Oh my God, Victoria, what a lot of commitment. <laughs> Kate, is a PhD candidate in microbiology and immunology at UBC and has been the chair of the code and policy committee at UBC's Graduate Student Society since October 2018. In this role, she has gained a variety of transferable professional skills and stakeholder consultation, organizing collaborative co collaboration between teams and developing organizational policy to serve graduate students better. As an avid user of public and academic libraries, she is excited to discuss these skills with the library sector. Peter served as one of the iSchool's two representatives to UBC's Graduate Student Society for a year and a half, from 2017 to 2018, during which time he had the pleasure of sitting on two hiring boards and the Governance and Accountability Committee and Human Resources Committee. He also co-designed a database for the GSS to track attendance and membership as his final project for the database design course. Following graduation, he worked briefly for, the, for BC Housing before finding more permanent, albeit auxiliary, work with the, BC, with the Burnaby Public Library. He also has a YouTube channel, Stacks and Facts, where he makes library propaganda. Tariq is a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Studies at UBC and the current Vice President of University and Academic Affairs at UBC's Graduate Student Society. 
has held many leadership positions within the pharmaceutical industry, US and Caribbean, which has allowed him to develop collaborative and organizational strategic skills. He now leverages these experiences and skills to advocate at the university level for graduate students' mental and financial health. Welcome, Victoria, Kate, Peter, and Tariq. And I turn it over to you now. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Annette, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, you'll notice that Kate isn't here yet, uh, but she'll be joining us shortly. She has the benefit I of- joined. Oh, she's here. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I, I got here just in time to hear my introduction. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, then, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're really excited to be hosting this panel online, uh, despite the conference being canceled. Um, as Annette mentioned and read our introduction for the panel, this is about uh, student government advocacy and library work, um, specifically about how student government and advocacy generally on the student level can act as wonderful experience, both in the library and information fields and beyond. Um, all of us, as you heard, just heard, have been heavily involved in student government in various levels. And so we'd love to talk to you more about our specific experiences. Uh, and, and what that's done for us and why other students should also get involved too if there are students here listening. So, all right, uh, let's get started. We'll go one by one and just introduce you to a few of our panelists here in more detail. So Tariq, please go right ahead. Hey, uh, thank you, Annette, again for that wonderful um, brief introduction. Um, I'll just take this opportunity just to highlight just a little bit more about my involvement in student government and what sort of trajectory that I, um, I took. So as Anit mentioned before, I am a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Um, coming into UBC, I first joined the GSS, first as an ordinary member of the Governance and Accountability Committee. And that really rocked the boat for me in terms of um, getting more involved in student government. And um, eventually I stepped up to become the chair of that committee. And eventually um, I ran in a by-election to become the vice president of uh, university and academic affairs within the GSS. Now that's a very long terminology, but basically it's the, it's the vice president of the GSS that interacts with university bodies and university offices um, that, that, that will support and liaise the, the interests of graduate students um, to the university itself. Um, so in that role, I did a lot of advocacy to the university, mainly on the front of, um, you know, graduate, supporting graduate student mental health, um, you know, sexual awareness, and, and, and um, as well as equity, diversity, and inclusion within university spaces um, for UBC graduate students. I also did a lot of advocacy work on um, finance, um, financial health of graduate students. And I think one of the things that I'm most proud about in terms of that front was um, the work that I did to support the President's Academic um, firm, um, Renewal Fund that was recently launched um, just about a month or so ago. Um, in my current role now, so I, I, I am no longer the current VP UAA, but I am now the uh, student senator for graduate representative to the university senate um, in that role, I um, sit on the research and um, curriculum committees and basically what I do is I represent graduate interests um, on those committees for like research um, improvement, research funding for graduate students, as well as for the implementation of new curriculum um, that various programs at UBC would want to implement that are brought to the Senate. So, as you can see, I've been very involved in graduate um, graduate life at UBC since joining. I'm in my second year right now and I am loving every bit of it and hopefully I can share and inspire some of um, you know the listeners today to get involved if they're still graduate students or even get involved in any um, governance or accountability um, you know offices with which within whatever um, organization that you guys are working in. So thank you. Great thank you so much. All right, so next we have myself. Hi, I'm Victoria. Um, so I was currently in the program as of today, I guess, because today is the iSchool graduation ceremony. So I apparently have my MLIS now. <laughs> um, I did serve as the GSS rep from the iSchool to uh, the GSS counselor for two years. 
um, during which I was I received counselor of the year and I was also chair of the governance and accountability committee and um, most maybe locally I was co-president and various other roles for the iSchool Student Association LASA um, and in terms of actual employment uh, I was student and librarian at North Vancouver district and archives coordinator for the UBC linguistics department um, the kind of impetus for this panel and my uh, wanting to bring in my fellow student government uh, co-workers is that during this time working for LASA I realized how much of the work really felt a lot like what we were learning to be library work uh, it's about hearing the needs of your community and filling those needs in whatever means you can and trying to work with those people instead of um, just you know trying to serve them indirectly. It was about relationship building. It was about um, equity, diversity, accountability. It was about transparency. Um, and so I wanted to see more of this discussion about student government in a more public setting because uh, in the job descriptions we were reading, in the textbooks we're reading, you see you know, library experience or library jobs requiring, and information jobs in general requiring certain years of desk experience or having to work in the actual field when a lot of the times students, when they're being students, they don't have the time. They are too busy focusing on courses, on you know, jobs that just put food on the table, on these extracurriculars that look good on a CV but aren't necessarily quote unquote real work. Um, but I wanted to fight against that and I found great support here <laughs> uh, for this idea that our, our work with student government and advocacy was really um, about, it, it was library work, and it was information work and uh, these lovely folks, Tariq and Kate, although they aren't in the library field, um, have echoed that this has been useful to them in other fields as well. So it, it seems to be widely applicable. So um, yeah, with that in mind, the, my experience here with GSS and with LASA um, has, you know, affirmed my wanting to work in public and community libraries to work uh, with as well as for people um, to strengthen my interest in student organizing, although I am no longer a student. And uh, also my, my previous degree in linguistics carries through in my wanting to serve heritage language learning communities um, and multicultural services. So um, that's a little bit about me and I'm happy to talk more about that. But in the meantime, I will hand it over to the next panelist, Peter. Hello. Uh, so I'm Peter. Um, I was the UBC iSchool, I guess now it's the School of Information, um, GSS rep from 2017 to 2018. Uh, and I was, well, talk about how that happened in a minute. Um, I was then awarded Breakthrough Council of the Year in 2018 on my outgoing term. Uh, I finished my master's uh, at UBC this time last year, or yeah, this time last year, uh, and I make library propaganda. Uh, and how all of this ties into the GSS is, um, oh, and then my area of expertise is very cheekily doing so much all at once, maybe too much, it's probably fine. Uh, I, while I was doing my master's, I kind of had a um, track record of doing all the things uh, and that's because I did two courses per term max uh, and then in the time that that gave me I served on GSS uh, I did research for UBC library I was a wellness peer a graduate wellness peer uh, for student services um, I taught the tech and the tour uh, tech and the core courses um, and yeah served on two two committees in the GSS um, and from all of that I think the thing that I really got from being a part of the GSS was like getting out, uh, it's, I found that it was really easy if I didn't push myself um, to really stay in the, in the library world. And when you graduate, uh, you are no longer in library world. Like you still, you have that bubble of the people that immediately surround you. But like what I was really excited about working in libraries was um, meeting the community that you serve uh, and getting to know people and what they need uh, when they aren't necessarily the people that you spend all of your time with. Uh, I've been really fortunate to do some community work with Burnaby Public Library, um, even just as an auxiliary. Uh, oh, and then it says former librarian. I am once again a librarian at Burnaby Public Library uh, because I got recalled just yesterday. Um, so uh, yeah, that's kind of my shtick. Uh, and then, well, yeah, 
and I make library propaganda because I think more people need to know how cool libraries are. Uh, and my understanding from talking to the people who aren't in library world 24 seven is that they really don't know what librarianship or LIS is about. Uh, and so having an opportunity to tell them in a way that is accessible is super fun and super gratifying. So that's me. Great, thank you. All right, and last but not least, we have Kate. Hello, so I just graduated with a PhD in microbiology and immunology. I was a departmental representative for that department uh, with the GSS for a year. Most of my involvement in the GSS was with committees, however. Uh, and a lot of that experience that I got with committees was directly relevant to my first work position now as an intern at the Council of Canadian Academies, where I do a lot of research and writing uh, on science policy relevant reports. And a lot of the transferable skills I gained in my committee work uh, came up in my interview for the CCA. Uh, with the committees, I was primarily working as the chair of Code and Policy Committee, and for that role, I received the Best Committee Chair Award in 2019. I also recently received the AMS Just Desserts Award in 2020 for overall contributions to the GSS, uh, and have experience with a, as I said, variety of different committees, uh, which were relevant to an overall picture of student government operations. Um, as a library enthusiast, I am excited to talk to all of you as librarians about how the various transferable skills that you can gain through student government are applicable to the real world uh, and particularly about uh, the role of committees and the collaborative activities that take place within those. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, kind of following our initial vision for this panel, we want this to be a very interactive kind of Q&A style uh, discussion. We have some questions prepared to ask ourselves. <laughs> Um, which we will elaborate on, but please feel free at any time to ask us questions in the chat. Uh, as Annette mentioned, you can send it to all panelists um, or all panelists and uh, attendees. Kate will be the one monitoring and she will read those aloud for you. Um, but yeah, feel free anytime or save it to the end. Uh, but with that, we'll, we'll head into some questions uh, for these lovely folks. So let's explain how student government works. <laughs> I'm sure this is a very simple and easy to understand graph that I don't need to go into. Um, just kidding. This is how a student government at UBC is broadly structured. So uh, student government at UBC uh, kind of looks like these two groups at the top. We have the AMS, the Alma Mater Society, which represents all, all students at UBC. That's undergraduate, graduate, everyone. Then there's the GSS, which we have all been a part of and which been, we have been primarily talking about. Um, that represents just the graduate students. Uh, it is a nonprofit society, uh, and you can see that it is primarily driven and uh, directed by the council, which acts as the board of directors for this nonprofit. And the council is made up of departmental representatives, so that would be people like me and Peter, who represented the iSchool, and Kate, who represented microbiology and immunology, and external representatives, um, for example, Tariq in his role as Senate sits on the council. And together we all work to kind of direct the GSS to do things, um, including advocating for graduate students on particular issues like financial health. Um, so the power really lies with the counselors um, and not necessarily the executives that you know, are the face of, um, of the society. So you, you end up having a lot of power sitting on this thing. Um, but yeah, so that's just a brief uh, overview. If you have questions about how that works, please feel free to ask us as well. So yes, so uh, a little again, a little bit more detail. When we talk about LASA, we're talking about the Student Association for the Library and Archival um, Studies School, um, the iSchool. And we represent graduate students in the iSchool of all programs. So that's the library students, the archives, the dual, the children's literature, and the PhD. Um, we have two representatives on council, which is why Peter and I have both uh, served concurrently at one point. And again, the GSS, which acts as the registered nonprofit um, that's dedicated to representing and advocating for students and providing academic, professional, social, and recreational services. So GSS is really trying to um, fill all the needs of students as much as it can. Um, but yeah, okay, so we have here our first question for our panelists. Um, if we could please describe one of your most valuable experiences in student government. Um, I'm going to just go down the line of what I can see here. So I, that puts uh, Tariq first. Tariq, if you don't mind, please go ahead. Sure, no problem. Um, 
So um, the question is, describe one of your most valuable experience in student government. Uh, I would say my most valuable experience in student government would have to be the period when I was the vice president of the, the University of Ac and Academic Affairs of the GSS. Um, we are actively advocated for social issues that affected graduate students. Um, I think I mentioned before that one of the core, some of the core issues that I really tried to triumph was um, increasing the awareness of sexual assault um, and um, increasing the um, diversity in within university spaces. And I also tackled for a brief moment gender inequality issues at UBC as well. I think having to navigate the university spaces and individuals with varying thoughts on the above in, um, issues that I mentioned earlier really helped to develop my communication and listening skills. Um, you know, you had to be a little bit tactful in terms of how you bring across certain information to people, especially people who are very ignorant to, to a, a lot of these issues. And so you have to bring it across in such a way that they can understand and really resonate with um, how others might be feeling about these issues. Um, it also forced me to understand um, these issues for myself. Um, I've never been a victim of sexual assault, um, um, nor have I ever been a, a victim of gender inequality. Um, so I had to first put myself out there to understand what are the potential impact that these might have on victims of these particular issues. And so I had to increase my awareness on many social and civic layers that exist within the university and organizational spaces themselves. What I think much bigger than just the self-benefit for me was just the widespread impact that I could enact for these um, groups, minority groups across campus. And for me, that was really the penultimate benefit that I gained from, um, from, um, from student government. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Peter, you're next on my screen. Would you like to describe something wonderful you did? Oh, sure. Um, so it's kind of, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to say that the most valuable experiences I had were the class of experiences that I had actually doing hands-on stuff with the GSS uh, related to what I was studying. Um, so I, uh, Victoria, could you go back like two slides to the really scary sure. one? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I did database design uh, while I was doing my master's uh, with Richard. And for the final, like for the graduating project, uh, I did a, I designed a database uh, to track attendance and participation of all of the grad student society members uh, and the different components, uh, including like who was a counselor, who was an executive, how long they'd been each of these, like did we have the right paperwork on them because like for any just like any nonprofit organization there's a certain amount of paperwork that has to be done uh, record keeping has to be maintained to stay legally compliant um, all of these different things so this is a, a screenshot of the map of relationships between different entities uh, for the GSS uh, another thing that I was really fortunate to do was I was able to work with one of the um, the executives and of course I can't remember the exact name right now, but working on their record keeping stuff. Uh, so they tracked interactions that they had with students uh, to advocate for them whenever students needed some adv advocacy done. And it was all within the context of keeping things anonymous. So getting to see what that actually looks like in an organization serving 10,000 people with an operating budget of like $700,000. Um, and to see like, even at that size, they still have to rely on a certain amount of volunteer um, labor to get that done. Um, and I did some consulting with the other executives and all of these really came together as a singular experience of like really seeing what it takes to make an organization run uh, and to make sure an organization can stay compliant with all of the information uh, rules uh, that are out there. So that would be my, my experience. Awesome. And it is a very impressive diagram. <laughs> Until you know what it means. <laughs> All right, I'll hand it over to Kate. So I am going to be um, 
bit more specific about this and uh, refer to experience I had working on the policy for the graduate student financial aid. Um, this was a bit of a big deal because we had previously had an emergency fund that was no longer operational uh, and it was a priority of the executive at the time to bring that back. Um, the advocacy um, centric committee ACEX had been working uh, quite extensively on the content of that in terms of what they wanted to do. And it was in fact a very contentious issue uh, at the time that it was brought to the Code and Policy Committee for looking at the clarity review. Um, we had some very extensive discussions about what the intent of certain parts was and how we could make sure that this was clear and that we had appropriate procedures to ensure that the assessments of these financial aid applications uh, was fair, um, but also efficient because of the resources that the USS had as uh, a student government organization. Obviously, those are less than the enrollment services. Um, so operating within that context was also very important. And this was uh, a, a very in-depth discussion and one that definitely um, made use of a lot of those conflict management techniques as the committee chair at that point to ensure that um, we were able to hear the different views on play and uh, ultimately come to a consensus about the final policy. And of course, the end impact of that was that we were able to uh, then launch this graduate student financial aid program that has been able to successfully disperse money to students in need. So that was something that was very rewarding, both in terms of the process being interesting to work through and to learn a whole lot about how to put together a policy on something as important as financial aid, and also to see that implemented and having an impact on the community. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of mystery around what exactly people in student government work on, but it's, it's wonderful mm -hmm. when you get to do something so obviously and tangibly important like that. I think it was really impressive at the time just watching watching you guys work on this financial aid policy because it, you know it could have been a policy like any other and treated with you know cavalierness but it was it was taken seriously it was really um, exciting to watch. Yeah um, and it was really rewarding to see how seriously everyone involved took it like people are really wanting to give their best to this. Absolutely. Um, Great. So yeah, as for myself, um, like I say, I think there's a lot of mystery about like what student government is. Like, is it just all of us sitting in a room saying I or nay to random things? And um, my experience was one that really highlighted to me all the hard work that can go in behind the scenes and to great effect. So um, during my time as GSS rep, I was um, wonderfully trusted by a fellow student at the iSchool with their experience where um, they had not received some uh, pay from their employee at UBC um, for statutory holidays, which is a, um, a provincially mandated pay that you receive if you fulfill certain requirements before a statutory holiday comes up. Uh, and they told me that, you know, this was a problem that they were experiencing and it wasn't necessarily with their direct supervisor because their direct supervisor hadn't been aware or had tried but wasn't working, et cetera. And knowing that I was a representative of them to the GSS, they came to me and they said, I've been having these roadblocks and I can't seem to get anywhere. And I wonder if you could help me because it seems like it would probably be an issue that affects other graduate students and not just me in this one case. And, um, you know, I was very fortunate. I was happy to do that work because of course that's the core of the work that we do as representatives of our departments is we're trying to represent the needs of those departments. Uh, and, you know, uh, I took that to LASA uh, as, a, as an executive and I, because I could have gone straight to GSS Council um, and just brought it up out of nowhere, but I understood that it was something that I should make sure that my fellow executives, <clears throat> excuse me, and department representatives also understood what was going on and whether they felt, also felt that it was something that I should be doing because you know, ultimately hearing one student say something is fine, but I need to make sure that I have a consensus because I'm answering to a community of people. So I very luckily got uh, their consent to go to council and bring it forward, um, anonymizing student identities, et cetera, as needed. But um, it was one of those things where I approached the appropriate committee. They uh, were absolutely supportive, echoed the fact that like, yes, they are in other departments, but this would certainly be something that would affect their students as well, and that it would be appropriate to take it to the executives of the GSS 
for them to advocate on our behalf to UBC executives. So it showed me the power of like, not only building these relationships with your students, right? Because ultimately that student trusted me, um, but also understanding how to work the system in a way that gets us a result that is better for our students. You know, I, I could have just stood up in the room and just said like, hey, this isn't right. And, you know, probably wouldn't have gotten as far as we did. Um, but in the end, uh, which I'm very happy about, my executives uh, were able to advocate on behalf of me, on behalf of my students um, to UBC and enact um, some more uh, transparent and clear ways of reporting pay, thus, you know, allowing a lot of students at UBC to receive their statutory holiday pay that they so rightly deserved. Um, because it was in the hundreds for many students. <laughs> so it was an important, again, like the financial aid thing, it's a real tangible result um, that I was very, very happy to have, you know, I, was, I, was, I felt fortunate to have been able to participate in it. And I think it also showed, you know, from then on to the rest of the students that like, this is some power that you also have. You can, you know, it, it didn't really matter that I was the one doing it. It was just that you had the power to talk to your representatives and have them, you know, enact change on your behalf. And it was really um, eye-opening and also extremely uh, valuable just going forward in life, um, knowing, knowing the extent of your power is such that it is. Um, awesome, okay. So I'm gonna move on to the next question for our panelists. And we'll just go in the same order as last time if that's cool with you guys. So I have a very general, scary question. What does leadership mean to you? Uh, Tariq, if you don't mind, please start us off. Yeah, this is a very scary question to, um, to answer and come up with a, a, a very clear cut answer. Um, but, you know, most, most textbooks will describe leadership as, you know, the process by which a person can influence others to accomplish an, an objective and direct organization in such a way that makes it more coherent and cohesive. But for me, this is really only half of what leadership is. And um, it's much more about self-sacrifice and altruism to one's community. I do not believe that uh, to be a leader, you have to hold a position in an office or an official title. Um, uh, I think anyone can be a leader. Uh, it's much more about the desire to create meaningful and impactful change that eventually channels others around you to follow and support you. Um, to add to that, I also think uh, leadership should entail uh, the ability to identify leadership potential in others. Um, by developing leadership skills within your own team and by creating an environment where you can continue that success for long term is really the true measure of great leadership. And so I want to challenge, um, you know, our, 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 our listeners today, um, if you think that you have, um, if, if you're in a position of leadership, or if you are uh, a leader in your own um, field, that you should learn to identify, um, you know, individuals which have leader, leadership potential and kind of nurture those so that whenever you move on to, you know, other areas in life, that you know, that particular field does not suffer and that there's someone else really carrying on, on, on that, that, that button for you. So really that's what leadership means to me. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point about recognizing leadership in others. I think that that comes up a lot in student government, especially when the turnover for our positions is so high. Uh, we're gone in a year or two. Um, so that's wonderful. Okay, I have Peter next. Peter, if you don't mind. Yeah, I mean, I think Tariq got it pretty pretty solidly. When I think about leadership, um, it's not about thinking about the person who's at the top. It's about thinking about what the person at the top can do to enable everyone else um, to achieve some common goal. Uh, so, um, and like the context of my understanding of leadership is I was in I was in the Navy for six years before I became a librarian before I went to grad school. Um, and in that environment, you have a very specific hierarchy, like you know exactly who's above you and you know exactly who's below you because you're ranked. Um, and I always really appreciated um, having good leadership when I had it. And I always appreciated being able to recognize bad leadership when I had it. Um, 
I worked as a as a victim advocate uh, for a while while I was in the Navy. And it was very clear in certain circumstances when you had a good leader who like, I would go to them and say, hey, this person was the victim of a, of a violent crime and I have to do this and this and this for them. Um, and knowing that the good leader is just gonna be like, I trust you, I trust your judgment. Um, let me know if you need help, um, but otherwise do what you gotta do. Uh, and then there would be bad leadership where it was not like that. Uh, and being able to bring that into my own experience into library world, as it were, or the non-uniform services uh, is a real privilege. Um, and so that's kind of how I see leadership. Again, like it's not the person at the top. Uh, it's how the person at the top enables everyone around them, not necessarily below them, but above them as well, um, to achieve some common thing. Um, and yeah, like Tariq says, if you are in the fortunate position of being in a leadership position and you can enable leadership to happen around you, please do so. Um, I think that every profession, but uh, definitely librarianship can benefit from having leadership that is more about empowering their people uh, than necessarily telling them what to do. Um, and then that also goes to the wider trend in librarianship that's been coming up uh, over like the past couple decades of community led libraries. Um, the community is the leader uh, in that in that situation. You need to listen to what your community is telling you they need uh, and help them realize it. Uh, and, you know, sometimes the community in involves your staff. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's a good point about the community led libraries. It's we're not leading the community. <laughs> They're leading us. Okay, uh, Kate, would you mind? Yeah, I think that uh, Tariq and Peter have said just about everything that I would have wanted to say. These are fantastic discussions of leaderships. Uh, the one other point I will add to Peter's um, point that it is about empowering people is that that does ideally involve recognizing people's various strengths and where people can make their greatest contribution to the group. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think um, if, yeah, like you guys handled it so well, this is a tough question, you nailed it. But if there's one thing that I can also add, it's, um, I think it's very tempting in student government, but also in other positions to, you know, say, well, we've always done it this way. We've always had these events. We've always organized these, whatever. This policy has been in place for forever. Let's just follow it. It's easier. I have too much other work to do. And it was a challenge for me but a one that I, I, I welcomed and I tried to face bravely um, to really listen, even if the voices seemed quiet. <laughs> you know, uh, student engagement has always been an issue, like an issue in the sense that it's hard for students to engage in things because they're just so busy with everything else. Um, but when you're in a position like president of a student association or you're organizing events or you're trying to work on um, you know, change or policies or other actions in the committee, if you're hearing something that's different from what you normally would do, you really have to answer that. If people are saying something small like, hey, we really hate having social teas, we never want to drink tea again, then you have to respect that no matter how much tea you just bought. <laughs> you have to say, okay, well, then we're not going to do it. What else would you like to do instead? And if they don't respond, then they don't respond, and that's fine. You have to give people their space too. But it, you know, that expands to, okay, you're in a committee and no one is in agreement about this policy, even though you worked hard on it and you brought it forward. And if people are giving you backlash and they're saying this wasn't done well and we don't like it for X, Y, and Z reason, you have to answer to them. Like the, the policy, the work that you're doing is for people. And if you're receiving feedback that isn't, what you would consider favorable or has just been you know contradictory to something you have to answer that and i think that's um it's a difficult skill to learn as a leader but it's a very vital one um and i think it's actually come quite to the forefront in recent events with um you know all of the the social justice activism that's happening as well if you're hearing people um you know shouting out against something you really do have to listen to it and know when to take a, a step back to if it's not your place to to criticize, um, would not to not to get to uh, I guess divergent here, but um, I think it's been really really key. Um, okay. One thing, 
along That's those great. lines uh, that I think is also worth calling out is I think a really, really important and probably undervalued for silly gender reasons um, aspect of leadership is empathy. Um, I think that the best leaders understand that they have to try, at least make the effort to empathize. And it's not something that just automatically comes to you. Um, but with practice, it gets easier. Um, but one of the best ways to do that, I think, is to fake it until you got it. And so in the case of leadership, fake empathy until you have real empathy is just don't talk. Like just spend some time listening to the, what, people, what the people are telling you um, and don't feel pressured to give an answer uh, to or a response to anything immediately. Um, it's okay to sit with input uh, until you find yourself in a place where you can actually do something good with it. Or even finding someone else who would have more expertise or, you know, if you're not doing well in a position, find someone else who, who can do it better than you, who, who's a better representative for sure. I think a common theme that's coming out just like out of everyone's answer right now is the, the idea of emotional intelligence. Um, like that's just like if you, if you don't have good emotional intelligence, if you're not able to read and understand, um, you know, people and and how they make decisions and being able to listen, you know, when to talk, when you know, then people are just not going to want to come to you, and you, you're just not going to be an effective leader, um, in that sense. So, I think that's a that's a common thread that's coming out with all of our our, our answers here: the idea of emotional intelligence. Yeah, and we, we talk a lot about that in library school. We talk a lot about how so much of the work ends up being emotional work and emotional labor. And I think it's, it's tempting to be like, oh, well, I'm good at it, so no worries. I don't need to think about it anymore. I'm an emotional, empathetic person. You know, done, move on. But it's, it, it's also a journey. Like, you have to really check in on yourself constantly, and you have to be working on this all the time and questioning yourself all the time. Like, was that really the, the most empathetic response I had or was I just tired that day? Like you, you really have to work on it. And it's a, it's, it's a skill. Uh, I don't know if it's one that like you can learn if you're born an evil person with no empathy, but you know, you, you should at least try. <laughs> um, the effort. One thing since I've been working in a library now for a little while um, that I think is easy to keep well, that's important to keep in mind is when you work in a library, you don't necessarily see the same person one day that you will the next day. And right now I'm talking in the context of patrons. Um, and like, I th one thing that I've noticed, and maybe it's because I'm at the bottom and I'm still fresh and not jaded, is that there are a lot of folks who are just really tired um, as librarians. And that comes through with how they interact with patrons. Um, and I think it's okay. It's okay to be tired. Uh, but I also think that when you become a librarian, please, please, please emphasize taking care of your own mental health. Uh, because when you show up, if that is the only interaction that you, if you only have one interaction with someone the entire time that they ever come to a library um, and it's negative, uh, that makes our job harder generally. Um, yeah. Speaking of emotional intelligence. Yeah. Taking care of yourself and your coworkers is hugely important. Good leaders can recognize when people are tired. <laughs> okay, awesome. That was cool, you guys. Excited. <laughs> okay, so our, our next question we have here is just what does student advocacy mean to you? Um, again, this is another very broad question. Don't feel like you have to answer uh, the right answer, but yeah, let's, uh, let's take a crack at it. Tariq, please feel free. All right, so student advocacy. I think this one is pretty straightforward. I think student advocacy at the, the pinnacle is always being pro-student. And what do I mean by being pro-student? I think um, it means providing confidential and effective guidance to students or peers who are um, in, in, in the case of GSS are in, for, in, in formal conflicts with the university. And what do I mean by formal conflicts? So like students who are called up for like academic disputes, non-academic disputes as well, housing appeals, library fines might be one of them as well, um, just from my experience. And um, being pro-student also means that even if the student or the represented individual is obviously in the wrong, uh, you know, just being a student advocate means that we always have to strive to support the student nonetheless. And what I want to be clear about is that that doesn't mean that we're going to um, always try and um, um, 
actively try and um, you know coerce the university to 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 not um, apply um, punitive actions or punitive measures on the, based on the students' actions. But it's much more about allowing the students to recognize if they are in the wrong that okay, these things that you did um, should, not be, should not have been done. And this is how we can work towards actually making sure that this does not happen again. And so it's much, much more about changing, like transformational change in the student's behavior rather than just trying to reduce the punitive fines that the university might enact on the student, based on the student's um, response. So in summary, for me, student advocacy is really just an, um, the ultimate sacrifice that, that anyone within university spaces can offer to their community and their fellow peers. It's again about selfless service, which uplifts others by actively lobbying for them on the concerns that they have, even if those concerns don't resonate with you or directly impact you yourself. Um, it's about having a discerning eye for you know, the challenges that others might experience and be willing and be bold enough to speak out and support um, these individuals on these issues. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, Peter, do you have uh, any thoughts? Um, same. Uh, an example that comes to mind from when I was in the GSS was uh, the grad research commons. Um, when I was a counselor, those existed in Kerner and then the one of the VPs of UBC went to the library and was like, hey, we need that space, please and thank you. Uh, and that was really upsetting. Um, and so the advocacy angle of that is like the GSS as an organization, um, we put together a statement as best as we could uh, and we started advocating for the library um, to keep the space for the library. Uh, ultimately, it, I don't think it worked out. I think admin still got the, the entire floor of Kerner because, you know, libraries don't need space or anything. I mean, everything's online, right? Um, but we did our best uh, and we made sure that folks knew that this was happening um, because that's what we had to do. That was, that was what we could do um, to make sure that students' best interests were be, being taken care of. Um, but yeah, basically making sure that it's the student's interest that we're looking out for um, first and foremost. Absolutely. Uh, Kate, any thoughts on what student advocacy is? Yeah, um, I think what I'd like to add is that there's often a lot of barriers for individual students being able to advocate for themselves within the university environment. Uh, and that it is really important to have an organization that can come and collectively present student issues to other parts of that university structure. And that is one of the reasons that it can be really rewarding to work as a part of the student government is because you're now able to um, bring some actual effective advocacy to bear on these issues that individual students might otherwise feel really lost on. Yeah, um, to kind of round it out, I definitely think that student advocacy is about finding the voices that aren't really being heard and at least giving them the opportunity to like stand on a more public stage if they want to or to present those voices to you for you to amplify. I think it came up a lot, you know, as um, when I was last our co-president, you can't, there's over 200 graduate students. I can't personally know every single one of them and know what they need, but you can, you know, give them the impression that you're there to listen and also try and find where they are speaking and you know try to work with them and see if that's something that they want to bring forward a lot you know sometimes people are fine not being heard or like not you know fighting the rah-rah and that's totally okay sometimes that communicates to you um as your as the student advocate that like they're more focused on getting their work done on getting through this program on getting their research done on making it through. And that's something that you can support too, um, you know, by making it easier for them to get through their program, by reassessing requirements, by giving them space for working on their thesis, whatever it happens to be. Um, and, it, and it comes through as well, like, you know, working on a committee, um, especially as the chair, a lot of the times my job was to make sure that everyone in the committee's voice was heard and brought forward and everyone's opinion was counted. Um, it's not about, you know, well, I'm pretty sure that I know what graduate students want, or I'm pretty sure I know what my students want. So I'm just going to 
roll, go on that. You have to really, you know, these people did step up. They did do that initial, I would like to be on the committee. I would like to participate, but sometimes it's still hard to make your voice heard, especially when you're in a group of other very uh, motivated, talented people. <laughs> You know, especially, you know, for example, at Jesus Council, when you have like 30 people and we're all, we're all go-getters, let's be real, because not only have we decided to be in a graduate program, we've also decided to dedicate our, our precious hours. Um, you know, and it's about making sure that the people who are maybe a little more shy or uncertain or contrarian even uh, are still heard and counted. Um, and, you know, sometimes those people are just shy. Sometimes it's because they've been previously like marginalized or oppressed and they don't feel like they have a voice or they uh, don't want to speak up because they're worried about repercussions academically or professionally or whatever it is. Um, you have to at least give them the space and the impression that um, you can be a tool for them to use. Um, you know, they don't have to, they can be the ones to speak up if they want, but it's about understanding that sometimes it's your job to, to speak for them, even if you don't necessarily agree with their uh, actions or opinions, like Tariq mentioned. Um, and I, I don't know if I would go so far as to say it's like the most sacrificey martyrdom ness but uh, it can be tough. It is a lot of like uh, quiet behind the scenes work, a lot of hours, a lot of meetings, a lot of sitting in a room that doesn't have proper air conditioning, <laughs> just to maybe say, I agree once an hour. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's, it's important. You're, you're not there to receive money or glory. Because, again, none of us got paid for this. And the executives, while they do receive a very small uh, compensation, it's not a living wage, even though it's basically a full-time job. And I know Tariq won't say that, but it's absolutely true. You know, it's, it's not about the money. It's never been about the money. And it's certainly not about the glory, because I don't know anyone who glorifies student government people. <laughs> I mean, unless you guys have experienced different. Is anyone receiving accolades for their student government work? <laughs> I mean, no, you don't receive accolades, but I think it's kind of rewarding when you advocate for certain groups and they recognize that they recognize the work that you've done, mm -hmm. or if you represent someone on academic appeals and you know you've essentially gotten them a less punitive action that they would have been thought they're very grateful so that's rewarding in its sense but otherwise the the monetary reward that's if that's what you're going for then i would say that that's probably not that it's not the best thing to go for that's you've got to love the process yeah yeah <laughs> trust the process yeah <laughs> okay we do have one last question for you guys i'm mindful of time if anyone has any questions for us that they want to put in the chat now's the time to do it um, Please ask us questions. <laughs> Even just what's your name again? I, you know, it's okay. Um, okay, I'll move on to the next one in the meantime, otherwise. So what surprised you? Uh, maybe I'll just start. What surprised me was uh, how much time it would be, especially when you start getting addicted to joining committees or signing up to work on a you know, some kind of initiative and it sounds so exciting because it's real and it's good work. And, you know, I'm also surprised by like how much I enjoyed working with these people. Like these guys all below me, they're my friends. They're fantastic. Everyone that works in student governments that I've met has been majority pretty great people that are interested in serving, uh, which are people like librarians also interested in serving pretty good people, mostly overall. Um, so it's been a pleasure to meet everyone and to do good work. And even though my poor partner often saw me crawl into the door at 11 midnight after a long council. <laughs> but uh, yeah, what else surprised you guys, Tariq, if you don't mind? So if I can butt in here, we have a question from the people watching. Uh, you mentioned there's a little bit of disconnect between library job descriptions and the kinds of experiences the students might actually have or are doing. What are some things you wish more employers or people in management or with more institutional power knew and would do more or less of? Yeah, Peter, do you have thoughts on this? I mean, I kind, I, I kind of alluded at, at it earlier um, about the idea of just being able to listen to your people um, and just hear what they have to say uh, and don't necessarily feel pressured to give an answer immediately. Just just take back what they said with you and think about it uh, and give it some true thought and fair consideration and then go to it. Uh, and then, you know, work with them to make it work. Um, yeah. 
Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I can speak uh, in terms of the job descriptions I have seen uh, for work that I'm interested in. I think there's, um, it's, it's kind of surprising to me that for a, a career and a field that is so interested in emotional labor, whether they know it or not, um, kind of is still playing along with this idea of you need like formal accreditation and you need to go through so many years of school and have had, you know, you need to have worked your way up through the ranks of whatever job um, when, you know, there's, there's at least not an explicit understanding of like, but what about the other kinds of emotional labor experience that I have? So, you know, that's whether it's you working in a nonprofit, you've worked for charities, you've worked in your community to organize um, some kind of change or event. These things that aren't so formal can really be like far more helpful than, you know, maybe having been a page in high school and shelved a couple books. Not to say that's not important work. We need our pages. But, um, you know, there's so much other work that can be valued. And I think it's, it's not a problem only in library fields and information fields but in other fields too there's um i think there's an undervaluing of the of the kind of emotional and community work that can be so 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 helpful and valuable yeah i've had that come up in a job interview uh, the interviewer being very focused the way they frame their questions on my formal experience and uh, then at one point in the interview they asked we noticed on your resume that you have student government experience um, perhaps you want to speak to that and all of a sudden it became so much easier to answer the questions um, when that was potentially being very much overlooked otherwise with the focus on the formal experience. Yeah I think I think I'll just echo whatever you guys have just said. Um, I imagine that for library job descriptions there is the hard skills which is either you have that or you don't and then the soft skills which are those that you know you can pull from based on other aspects of it or, or um, not necessarily very applicable experiences. So for example, student government, if I was applying to be a pharmacist, um, that the, the experiences or the relatable, relative, um, how the experiences relate to pharmacy might not be um, evident, but it's really up to the, the applicant to know the experiences and to kind of leverage um, those experiences and how they can actually be applicable to whatever job that you'll be applying to. So I think knowing the experiences that you have been through and um, being able to really leverage those and communicate that in such a way that it's applicable to, your, to the actual job description is a very valuable skill to have um, just as a trainee going out there in, a, in an entry level position, um, having no experience at all. And I just wanna also add that, and, and yes, I'm throwing in the, the GSS does provide some um, CV and resume workshops which we, 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 we allow the, the participants to get some insights in how they can leverage their experiences for whatever roles they're applying for, whether it's in industry, if it's library, government, et cetera. So, you know, um, I would advise that our panelists take a look at some of those um, resources that the GSS have. I think that would be very useful. Yeah, get in touch with your student government reps if you're a student or ask people if they worked on it if you don't know anything about it. Um, okay, so I'm mindful of the time. So, um, um, oh, Peter, please. Yeah, just I to, have to head to a different meeting. If uh, you would like to continue the discussion, please go ahead. Okay, and thank you so much, uh, Kate, for great being us. here. Hi, Kate, thanks for being here. Uh, just because I have the platform uh, and because it is addressing to management and folks with institutional power, I would just like to give a flat out ask to end like abolish auxiliary librarianship and just make it that you either get part-time yes. or full-time work. Um, because there's definitely a thing right now where if you're an auxiliary, you are a second class employee. Um, you don't get benefits. You don't get guaranteed time off. You don't get so many things. Um, I, you will be the last to be recalled, we've discovered in an emergency. Um, and like, you know, I hope that the folks who are in my situation take this on and realize that, oh, this is a thing that I don't want to pass on when I find myself in a management or leadership position. Um, but uh, right now it's just kind of perpetuating itself. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. Precarious works. Not, not great. We're not about it. No. Um, okay. I'm going to move here. Thank you all for attending. We really appreciate it. Um, we have here our contact and our public professionally things if you want to follow us or talk to us more about student government and library work and 
everything. Um, but yeah, thank you again for joining us. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Annette. Thanks, y'all. That was great. Thank you so much. Thanks to Kate, uh, even though I know she's just exited. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Tariq. I think you've made some really great points. I think you've um, touched on a lot of the uh, conversations that need to be had in greater depth uh, in, in our field. And really appreciate you uh, being brave and uh, talking about them. Thank you. I think, um, I think a lot of people will enjoy your session. Uh, we have recorded it. So if people um, want to go watch it again, or for those of you that are seeing it live and you want to recommend it to other people, please um, go to the BCLA website and that's uh, www.bclaconnect.ca. And there, this link will be up in a couple of days, uh, if not sooner. There's also, you'll see the links to the other sessions too. But please um, tell people about this session. I think it's really worth watching um, and uh, helps us all think about where we're going uh, uh, as an institution. Where, who are we as a library? Who do we want to be and where do we need to go? Thanks for opening that conversation. And uh, I hope we're, that uh, we see you all again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you.